Criminology from Latin crimen, accusation, originally derived from the ancient Greek verb krino, krino, and ancient Greek logia, logi, logia, from logos meaning, word, reason, or plan is the scientific study of the nature, extent, management, causes, control, consequences, and prevention of criminal behavior, both on individual and social levels. Criminology is an interdisciplinary field in both the behavioral and social sciences, drawing especially upon the research of sociologists, psychologists, philosophers, psychiatrists, biologists, social anthropologists, as well as scholars of law. The term criminology was coined in 1885 by Italian law professor Raffaele Garofalo as criminologia. Later, French anthropologist Paul Topin had used the analogous French term criminology. In the United States for the past 100 years, criminology has experienced three life course phases: one, golden age of research (1900 to 1930), which has been described as multiple factor approach; two, golden age of theory (1930 to 1960), which shows that there were no systematic way of connecting criminological research to theory; and three, a 1960 to 2000 period, which was seen as a significant turning point for criminology. Criminological schools of thought In the mid-18th century, criminology arose as social philosophers gave thought to crime and concepts of law. Over time, several schools of thought have developed. There were three main schools of thought in early criminological theory spanning the period from the mid-18th century to the mid-20th century, classical, positivist, and Chicago. These schools of thought were superseded by several contemporary paradigms of criminology, such as the subculture, control, strain, labeling, critical criminology, cultural criminology, postmodern criminology, feminist criminology and others discussed below. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Classical school. The classical school arose in the mid-18th century and has its basis in utilitarian philosophy. Cesare Beccaria, author of On Crimes and Punishments (1763–64), Jeremy Bentham, inventor of the Panopticon, and other philosophers in this school argued: People have free will to choose how to act. The basis for deterrence is the idea humans are hedonists who seek pleasure and avoid pain, and rational calculators who weigh the costs and benefits of every action. It ignores the possibility of irrationality and unconscious drives as motivators. Punishment of sufficient severity can deter people from crime, as the costs penalties outweigh benefits, and severity of punishment should be proportionate to the crime. The more swift and certain the punishment, the more effective as a deterrent to criminal behavior. This school developed during a major reform in penology, when society began designing prisons for the sake of extreme punishment. This period also saw many legal reforms, the French Revolution, and the development of the legal system in the United States. Topic. Positivist school The positivist school argues criminal behavior comes from internal and external factors out of the individual's control. Philosophers within this school applied the scientific method to study human behavior. Positivism comprises three segments, biological, psychological and social positivism. Topic. Italian school Cesare Lombroso (1835–1909), an Italian sociologist working in the late 19th century, is often called the father of criminology. He was one of the key contributors to biological positivism and founded the Italian school of criminology. Lombroso took a scientific approach, insisting on empirical evidence for studying crime. He suggested physiological traits such as the measurements of cheekbones or hairline, or a cleft palate, could indicate atavistic criminal tendencies. This approach, whose influence came via the theory of phrenology and by Charles Darwin's theory of evolution, has been superseded. Enrico Ferri, a student of Lombroso, believed social as well as biological factors played a role, and believed criminals should not be held responsible when factors causing their criminality were beyond their control. Criminologists have since rejected Lombroso's biological theories, since control groups were not used in his studies. Topic. Sociological positivism 
Sociological positivism suggests societal factors such as poverty, membership of subcultures, or low levels of education predispose people to crime. Adolf Coutelet used data and statistical analysis to study the relationship between crime and sociological factors. He found age, gender, poverty, education, and alcohol consumption were important factors to crime. Lance Lochner performed three different research experiments, each one proving education reduces crime. Rawson W. Rawson used crime statistics to suggest a link between population density and crime rates, with crowded cities producing more crime. Joseph Fletcher and John Glyde read papers to the Statistical Society of London on their studies of crime and its distribution. Henry Mayhew used empirical methods and an ethnographic approach to address social questions and poverty, and gave his studies in London labour and the London poor. Emile Durkheim viewed crime as an inevitable aspect of a society with uneven distribution of wealth and other differences among people. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Differential association, subcultural. People learn crime through association. This theory was advocated by Edwin Sutherland. These acts may condone criminal conduct, or justify crime under specific circumstances. Interacting with anti-social peers is a major cause. Reinforcing criminal behavior makes it chronic. Where there are criminal subcultures, many individuals learn crime, and crime rates swell in those areas. Topic. Chicago School. The Chicago School arose in the early 20th century, through the work of Robert E. Park, Ernest Burgess, and other urban sociologists at the University of Chicago. In the 1920s, Park and Burgess identified five concentric zones that often exist as cities grow, including the zone of transition, which was identified as the most volatile and subject to disorder. In the 1940s, Henry McKay and Clifford R. Shaw focused on juvenile delinquents, finding that they were concentrated in the zone of transition. Chicago school sociologists adopted a social ecology approach to studying cities and postulated that urban neighborhoods with high levels of poverty often experience breakdown in the social structure and institutions such as family and schools. This results in social disorganization, which reduces the ability of these institutions to control behavior and creates an environment ripe for deviant behavior. Other researchers suggested an added social psychological link. Edwin Sutherland suggested that people learn criminal behavior from older, more experienced criminals with whom they may associate. Theoretical perspectives used in criminology include psychoanalysis, functionalism, interactionism, Marxism, econometrics, systems theory, postmodernism, genetics, neuropsychology, evolutionary psychology, etc. Topic: <laughs> Social structure theories. This theory is applied to a variety of approaches within the basis of criminology in particular and in sociology more generally as a conflict theory or structural conflict perspective in sociology and sociology of crime. As this perspective is itself broad enough, embracing as it does a diversity of positions. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Social disorganization neighborhoods. Social disorganization theory is based on the work of Henry McKay and Clifford R. Shaw of the Chicago School. Social disorganization theory postulates that neighborhoods plagued with poverty and economic deprivation tend to experience high rates of population turnover. This theory suggests that crime and deviance is valued within groups in society, subcultures, or gangs. These groups have different values to the social norm. These neighborhoods also tend to have high population heterogeneity. With high turnover, informal social structure often fails to develop, which in turn makes it difficult to maintain social order in a community. Topic: <laughs> Social ecology. Since the 1950s, social ecology studies have built on the social disorganization theories. Many studies have found that crime rates are associated with poverty, disorder, high numbers of abandoned buildings, and other signs of community deterioration. As working and middle class people leave deteriorating neighborhoods, the most disadvantaged portions of the population may remain. William Julius Wilson suggested a poverty concentration effect, which may cause neighborhoods to be isolated from the mainstream of society and become prone to violence. Topic. 
strain theory social strain theory Strain theory, also known as Mertonian anime, advanced by American sociologist Robert Merton, suggests that mainstream culture, especially in the United States, is saturated with dreams of opportunity, freedom, and prosperity—as Merton put it, the American dream. Most people buy into this dream, and it becomes a powerful cultural and psychological motivator. Merton also used the term anime, but it meant something slightly different for him than it did for Durkheim. Merton saw the term as meaning a dichotomy between what society expected of its citizens and what those citizens could actually achieve. Therefore, if the social structure of opportunities is unequal and prevents the majority from realizing the dream, some of those dejected will turn to illegitimate means crime in order to realize it. Others will retreat or drop out into deviant subcultures, such as gang members, or what he calls, hobos. Robert Agnew developed this theory further to include types of strain which were not derived from financial constraints. This is known as general strain theory. <laughs> Messner and Rosenfeld institutional anime theory The Messner and Rosenfeld institutional theory stems from a pre-existing theory, discovered by Merton named strain theory. Rosenberger took his findings and offered a different approach to definition and based it on the assumption that everybody should already have the assumption that the American dream produces a society that is dominated by the economy and obsessed with the pursuit of success. The Messner and Rosenfeld institutional theory has many different views and definitions by many people therefore this becomes a very flexible theory. Larine Hughes found a correlation between economic pressure and how it combines the American dream and individualism to a high crime. Hughes came to final decision that, therefore, individuals that do not have the drive to succeed and achieve this goal will fail, despite social and cultural pressures. Samantha Applin, then took an approach relating genders and the Messner and Rosenfeld institutional theory. Stated in an article by S. Applin, Males make up what is considered normal subjects, and due to this, force women to lie on a boundary that expectation is outside the dominant cultural frame. Quote, Therefore, setting women back in the beginning stages of Messner and Rosenfeld institutional theory, Brian Stoltz began to research studies on the violence between youth and the correlation that it has on Messner and Rosenfeld institutional anime theory. Stoltz found sated as well as the results showed graduating high school represents an important developmental stage in American society, as it ends the compulsory education, and is often followed by a significant decline in daily need and extra resources from your parents. Topic subcultural theory Following the Chicago School and Strain Theory, and also drawing on Edwin Sutherland's idea of differential association, subcultural theorists focused on small cultural groups fragmenting away from the mainstream to form their own values and meanings about life. Albert K. Cohen tied anime theory with Sigmund Freud's reaction formation idea, suggesting that delinquency among lower class youths is a reaction against the social norms of the middle class. Some youth, especially from poorer areas where opportunities are scarce, might adopt social norms specific to those places that may include toughness and disrespect for authority. Criminal acts may result when youths conform to norms of the deviant subculture. Richard Cloward and Lloyd Olin suggested that delinquency can result from a differential opportunity for lower class youth. Such youths may be tempted to take up criminal activities, choosing an illegitimate path that provides them more lucrative economic benefits than conventional, over legal options such as minimum wage paying jobs available to them. Delinquency tends to occur among the lower working class males who have a lack of resources available to them and live in impoverished areas, as mentioned extensively by Albert Cohen. Cohen 1965. Bias has been known to occur among law enforcement agencies, where officers tend to place bias on minority groups, without knowing for sure if they had committed a crime or not. Delinquents may also commit crimes in order to secure funds for themselves or their loved ones, such as committing an armed robbery. As studied by many scholars Breyer and Pilaven, British subcultural theorists focused more heavily on the issue of class, where some criminal activities were seen as imaginary solutions to the problem of belonging to a subordinate class. A further study by the Chicago School looked at gangs and the influence of the interaction of gang leaders under the observation of adults. Sociologists such as Raymond D. Gastil have explored the impact of a Southern culture of honor on violent crime rates. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Control theories. 
Another approach is made by the social bond or social control theory. Instead of looking for factors that make people become criminal, these theories try to explain why people do not become criminal. Travis Hershey identified four main characteristics attachment to others, belief in moral validity of rules, commitment to achievement, and involvement in conventional activities. The more a person features those characteristics, the less likely he or she is to become deviant or criminal. On the other hand, if these factors are not present, a person is more likely to become a criminal. Hershey expanded on this theory with the idea that a person with low self-control is more likely to become criminal. As opposed to most criminology theories, these do not look at why people commit crime but rather why they do not commit crime. A simple example, someone wants a big yacht but does not have the means to buy one. If the person cannot exert self-control, he or she might try to get the yacht or the means for it in an illegal way, whereas someone with high self-control will more likely either wait, deny themselves of what want or seek an intelligent intermediate solution, such as joining a yacht club to use a yacht by group consolidation of resources without violating social norms. Social bonds, through peers, parents, and others can have a countering effect on one's low self-control. For families of low socioeconomic status, a factor that distinguishes families with delinquent children, from those who are not delinquent, is the control exerted by parents or chaperonage. In addition, theorists such as David Matzer and Gresham Sykes argued that criminals are able to temporarily neutralize internal moral and social behavioral constraints through techniques of neutralization. Topic: <laughs> Psychoanalysis and the unconscious desire for punishment. See main article Psychoanalytic Criminology Psychoanalysis is a psychological theory and therapy which regards the unconscious mind, repressed memories and trauma, as the key drivers of behavior, especially deviant behavior. Sigmund Freud talks about how the unconscious desire for pain relates to psychoanalysis in his novel, Beyond the Pleasure Principle. Freud suggested that unconscious impulses such as repetition compulsion and a death drive can dominate a person's creativity, leading to self-destructive behavior. Felita Rosnick, in the article Mental Pain and Social Trauma, posits a difference in the thoughts of individuals suffering traumatic unconscious pain which corresponds to them having thoughts and feelings which are not reflections of their true selves. There is enough correlation between this altered state of mind and criminality to suggest causation. Sander Gilman, in the article Freud and the Making of Psychoanalysis, looks for evidence in the physical mechanisms of the human brain and the nervous system and suggests there is a direct link between an unconscious desire for pain or punishment and the impulse to commit crime or deviant acts. <laughs> <laughs> Social network analysis Symbolic interactionism Symbolic interactionism draws on the phenomenology of Edmund Husserl and George Herbert Mead, as well as subcultural theory and conflict theory. This school of thought focused on the relationship between state, media, and conservative ruling elite and other less powerful groups. The powerful groups had the ability to become the significant other in the less powerful groups' processes of generating meaning. The former could to some extent impose their meanings on the latter, therefore they were able to «label» minor delinquent youngsters as criminal. These youngsters would often take the label on board, indulge in crime more readily, and become actors in the «self-fulfilling prophecy» of the powerful groups. Later developments in this set of theories were by Howard Becker and Edwin Lemmett, in the mid-20th century. Stanley Cohen developed the concept of «moral panic». Describing societal reaction to spectacular, alarming social phenomena e.g. post-World War II youth cultures like the mods and rockers in the UK in 1964, AIDS epidemic and football hooliganism. <laughs> <laughs> Labeling theory Labeling theory refers to an individual who is labeled in a particular way and was studied in great detail by Becker. It arrives originally from sociology but is regularly used in criminological studies. It is said that when someone is given the label of a criminal they may reject or accept it and continue to commit crime. Even those who initially reject the label can eventually accept it as the label becomes more well known, particularly among their peers. This stigma can become even more profound when the labels are about deviancy, and it is thought that this stigmatization can lead to deviancy amplification. 
Malcolm Klein conducted a test which showed that labeling theory affected some youth offenders but not others. Topic: <laughs> Individual theories. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Traitor theories. At the other side of the spectrum, criminologist Lonnie Athens developed a theory about how a process of brutalization by parents or peers that usually occurs in childhood results in violent crimes in adulthood. Richard Rhodes' Why They Kill describes Athens' observations about domestic and societal violence in the criminals' backgrounds. Both Athens and Rhodes reject the genetic inheritance theories. Topic: <laughs> Rational choice theory. Rational choice theory is based on the utilitarian, classical school philosophies of Cesare Beccaria, which were popularized by Jeremy Bentham. They argued that punishment, if certain, swift, and proportionate to the crime, was a deterrent for crime, with risks outweighing possible benefits to the offender. In Dei Delitti e del Pene on crimes and punishments, 1763–1764, Beccaria advocated a rational penology. Beccaria conceived of punishment as the necessary application of the law for a crime, thus, the judge was simply to conform his or her sentence to the law. Beccaria also distinguished between crime and sin, and advocated against the death penalty, as well as torture and inhumane treatments, as he did not consider them as rational deterrents. This philosophy was replaced by the positivist and Chicago schools and was not revived until the 1970s with the writings of James Q. Wilson, Gary Becker's 1965 article Crime and Punishment and George Stigler's 1970 article The Optimum Enforcement of Laws. Rational choice theory argues that criminals, like other people, weigh costs or risks and benefits when deciding whether to commit crime and think in economic terms. They will also try to minimize risks of crime by considering the time, place, and other situational factors. Becker, for example, acknowledged that many people operate under a high moral and ethical constraint but considered that criminals rationally see that the benefits of their crime outweigh the cost, such as the probability of apprehension and conviction, severity of punishment, as well as their current set of opportunities. From the public policy perspective, since the cost of increasing the fine is marginal to that of the cost of increasing surveillance, one can conclude that the best policy is to maximize the fine and minimize surveillance. With this perspective, crime prevention or reduction measures can be devised to increase the effort required to commit the crime, such as target hardening. Rational choice theories also suggest that increasing risk and likelihood of being caught, through added surveillance, law enforcement presence, added street lighting, and other measures, are effective in reducing crime. One of the main differences between this theory and Bentham's rational choice theory, which had been abandoned in criminology, is that if Bentham considered it possible to completely annihilate crime through the panopticon, Becker's theory acknowledged that a society could not eradicate crime beneath a certain level. For example, if 25% of a supermarket's products were stolen, it would be very easy to reduce this rate to 15%, quite easy to reduce it until 5%, difficult to reduce it under 3% and nearly impossible to reduce it to zero a feat which the measures required would cost the supermarket so much that it would outweigh the benefits. This reveals that the goals of utilitarianism and classical liberalism have to be tempered and reduced to more modest proposals to be practically applicable. Such rational choice theories, linked to neoliberalism, have been at the basics of crime prevention through environmental design and underpin the market reduction approach to theft by Mike Sutton, which is a systematic toolkit for those seeking to focus attention on crime facilitators by tackling the markets for stolen goods that provide motivation for thieves to supply them by theft. Topic: <laughs> Routine activity theory. Routine activity theory, developed by Marcus Felsen and Lawrence Cohen, draws upon control theories and explains crime in terms of crime opportunities that occur in everyday life. A crime opportunity requires that elements converge in time and place including a motivated offender, suitable target or victim, and lack of a capable guardian. A guardian at a place, such as a street, could include security guards or even ordinary pedestrians who would witness the criminal act and possibly intervene or report it to law enforcement. Routine activity theory was expanded by John Eck, who added a fourth element of place manager, such as rental property managers who can take nuisance abatement measures. Biosocial theories 
Biosocial criminology is an interdisciplinary field that aims to explain crime and antisocial behavior by exploring both biological factors and environmental factors. While contemporary criminology has been dominated by sociological theories, biosocial criminology also recognizes the potential contributions of fields such as genetics, neuropsychology, and evolutionary psychology. Aggressive behavior has been associated with abnormalities in three principal regulatory systems in the body serotonin systems, catecholamine systems, and the hypothalamic pituitary adrenocortical axis. Abnormalities in these systems also are known to be induced by stress, either severe, acute stress or chronic low-grade stress. <laughs> Marxist criminology In 1968, young British sociologists formed the National Deviance Conference group. The group was restricted to academics and consisted of 300 members. Ian Taylor, Paul Walton and Jock Young, members of the NDC, rejected previous explanations of crime and deviance. Thus, they decided to pursue a new Marxist criminological approach. In the new criminology, they argued against the biological positivism perspective represented by Lombroso, Hans Azenk and Gordon Trasler, according to the Marxist perspective on crime. Defiance is normal, the sense that men are now consciously involved in assuring their human diversity. Thus Marxist criminologists argued in support of society in which the facts of human diversity, be it social or personal, would not be criminalized. They further attributed the processes of crime creation not to genetic or psychological facts, but rather to the material basis of a given society. <laughs> Convict criminology Convict criminology is a school of thought in the realm of criminology. Convict criminologists have been directly affected by the criminal justice system, oftentimes having spent years inside the prison system. Researchers in the field of convict criminology such as John Irwin and Stephen Richards argue that traditional criminology can better be understood by those who lived in the walls of a prison. Martin Laver argues that, "...prisonization," oftentimes begins before prison, in the home, community, and schools. Topic. Queer criminology Queer criminology is a field of study that focuses on LGBT individuals and their interactions with the criminal justice system. The goals of this field of study are as follows To better understand the history of LGBT individuals and the laws put against the community why LGBT citizens are incarcerated and if or why they are arrested at higher rates than heterosexual and cisgender individuals how queer activists have fought against oppressive laws that criminalize LGBT individuals to conduct research and use it as a form of activism through education. Legitimacy The value of pursuing criminology from a queer theorist perspective is contested, some believe that it is not worth researching and not relevant to the field as a whole, and as a result is a subject that lacks a wide berth of research available. On the other hand, it could be argued that this subject is highly valuable in highlighting how LGBT individuals are affected by the criminal justice system. This research also has the opportunity to queer the curriculum of criminology in educational institutions by shifting the focus from controlling and monitoring LGBT communities to liberating and protecting them. Topic: <laughs> Cultural criminology. Cultural criminology theory has a historical and theoretical framework that help form new social and legal control between interacting with each generation. Ferrell believes criminologists can trace the manifold interactions like criminals, control agents, media producers, and others collectively construct the meaning of crime. He discussed that these variety of interactions was a way to show dominance towards society and the way things are run. Kane adds that cultural criminology has three tropes, village, city street, and mass media where males can be affected from their location to society's views on what is broadcast and accepted as what is the necessary things to do. The village where people are acquainted and engage in available activities and linking history of a person to a location can help decipher social dynamics. The city street involves positioning oneself in the cultural area. These are full of those affected by poverty, poor health and crime, and large buildings that impact the city but not neighborhoods. 
Mass media gives an all-around account of the environment and the possible other subcultures that could exist beyond a specific area. Not until later did Nagler and Salman introduce feminist theory that can cultural criminology could benefit with masculinities and femininities, sexual attraction and sexualities, and intersectionality themes rather than be an add-on later if it needs to be researched. Nagler and Salman believed that there was more to cultural criminology in the way that women and those who do not fit the exact mold that Ferrell has stated. Hayward would later add in not only feminist theory but the green theory played a role in the cultural criminology theory by he lens of adrenaline, the soft city, the transgressive subject, and the attentive gaze. The adrenaline lens deals with rational choice causing a person to have their own terms of availability of opportunity and low levels of social control. The soft city lens deals with reality outside of the city and imaginary sense of reality, the world where transgression occurs, where rigidity is slanted, and where rules are bent. The transgressive subject has an act of attraction of rule breaking and problems that a solution is attempted like trying to be themselves in a world where everyone is against them. The attentive gaze is when someone, mainly in ethnography, is immersed into the culture and interested in lifestyles, the symbolic, the aesthetic, and the visual aspects. When looked into and examined, the preconception is nowhere in sight and they are left with knowledge of that they are not all the same but come to a settlement of living together in the same space. Through it all, sociological perspective on cultural criminology theory brings an understanding on the environment and the people around that causes a person to do or not do crime. <laughs> Relative deprivation theory Relative deprivation involves the process where individuals measure their own well-being and materialistic worth against that of others and perceive that they are worse off compared to others whom they believe to be similar to themselves. When humans fail to obtain what they believe they ought to or what they believe they are entitled to have, they can experience a vast range of emotions, such as anger, injustice, disadvantaged, discontent, jealous, etc. Relative deprivation was originally utilized in the field of sociology by Samuel Stuffer, who had great influence in the infancy years of this theory. Stuffer revealed that soldiers fighting in World War II benchmarked their personal success on the individualized experience they had inside their respective units. They did not base performance levels off any standard military measure, only with their own respective group they worked with. Relative deprivation can be made up of societal, political, economic, or personality factors which can create this sense of unfairness or injustice. It is not based on an absolute approach of poverty, which would simply explain that people who are in poverty are always unhappy and discontent. Relative deprivation enforces the idea that even if somebody is doing fairly well off in life, they can still feel relatively deprived. It is not based off being poor or rich. The feeling of being financially relatively deprived, no matter one's financial situation, can result in criminal behavior and or morally problematic decisions. Relative deprivation theory has increasingly been used to partly explain crime due to the fact that rising living standards can result in rising crime levels. The criminological theory of relative deprivation explains that people who feel jealous and discontent, therefore might turn to crime to get the things that they can't afford but others have. Topic. Rural criminology Rural criminology is the study of crime trends outside of metropolitan and suburban areas. Rural criminologists have used social disorganization and routine activity theories. The FBI Uniform Crime Report shows that rural communities have significantly different crime trends as opposed to metropolitan and suburban areas. The crime in rural communities consists predominantly of narcotic-related crimes such as the production, use, and trafficking of narcotics. Social disorganization theory is used to examine the trends involving narcotics. Social disorganization leads to narcotic use in rural areas because of low educational opportunities and high unemployment rates. Routine activity theory is used to examine all low-level street crimes such as theft. Much of the crime in rural areas is explained through routine activity theory because there is often a lack of capable guardians in rural areas. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Types and definitions of crime. Both the positivist and classical schools take a consensus view of crime, that a crime is an act that violates the basic values and beliefs of society. Those values and beliefs are manifested as laws that society agrees upon. However, there are two types of laws. Natural laws are rooted in core values shared by many cultures. 
Natural laws protect against harm to persons e.g. murder, rape, assault or property, theft, larceny, robbery, and form the basis of common law systems. Statutes are enacted by legislatures and reflect current cultural mores, albeit that some laws may be controversial, e.g. laws that prohibit cannabis use and gambling. Marxist criminology, conflict criminology and critical criminology claim that most relationships between state and citizen are non-consensual and, as such, criminal law is not necessarily representative of public beliefs and wishes, it is exercised in the interests of the ruling or dominant class. The more right-wing criminologies tend to posit that there is a consensual social contract between state and citizen, therefore, definitions of crimes will vary from place to place, in accordance to the cultural norms and mores, but may be broadly classified as blue-collar crime, corporate crime, organized crime, political crime, public order crime, state crime, state corporate crime, and white-collar crime. However, there have been moves in contemporary criminological theory to move away from liberal pluralism, culturalism and postmodernism by introducing the universal term, harm, into the criminological debate as a replacement for the legal term, crime. <laughs> <laughs> Subtopics Areas of study in criminology include Comparative criminology, which is the study of the social phenomenon of crime across cultures, to identify differences and similarities in crime patterns. Crime prevention Crime statistics Criminal behavior Criminal careers and desistance Domestic violence Deviant behavior Evaluation of criminal justice agencies Fear of crime The International Crime Victims Survey Juvenile delinquency Penology Sociology of law Victimology See also Anthropological criminology British Society of Criminology Crime science Forensic psychology Forensic science List of criminologists Social cohesion The mask of sanity Taboo